<laughs> Gosh, it's amazing seeing so many people. Um, I, when um, Kay said we'd like you to do a floor talk on Saturday, I thought there might be 20 people. So I'm amazed um, at the response to, to this. Um, talking about painting is always a really difficult thing. You know, painting is a visual language. Turning it into uh, a oral language uh, is a difficult translation. And I'll do my best to try and illuminate some of the words because I know you probably look at some of them and you're slightly perplexed, possibly by uh, why I chose some of the works I chose and also what they mean. Um, I think it's an individual interpretation a lot of the time. And in fact, one of the uh, prize winners last night came up to me and said, um, I hadn't, and I'd written some, some words about her work, and she said, I, I hadn't thought about any of that. Um, and so I said, well, it is my interpretation. And I think the thing I want to stress with you is when I'm talking to you about painting, I'll talk about it in a, in a formal sense, uh, and to do with placement and shape and form and so on. But it's also my interpretation, and you're allowed to have yours. And you should have yours. I think a good painting um, appeals across all sorts of different levels. It needs to pull people in, possibly uh, at its most effective as a wide audience. And then it needs to be able to um, stand up to critiquing. Um, by people maybe who know a bit more about painting, who can talk about what's going on. And uh, a lot of painting can't do that. A lot of pa painting that's what I would call pedestrian painting, which is not a bad thing, but pedestrian painting is really painting that's good, solid painting, but it is what it is and it does nothing else over and above what you see. So <clears throat> I was looking for paintings that maybe had that sense within them of something else. It's to do with the intent of the artist, it's to do with an aim, it's to do with something that's carried. And then my interpretation might not be theirs, but I can feel a sense of something, and that makes the work very special. I think um, the visual arts is in some ways at a disadvantage to music. Um, with music we accept and listen to it and enjoy it, classical music is a lot of the time um, free from uh, interpretive analysis. It can be, uh, but a lot of the time we just say, that's great, I'm just letting that wash over me. You know, as you listen to Beethoven, we don't overanalyze it. We can sense that there's something driving him to make that music, to, to build that structure, to have us and hold us and make us believe something. And I think painting is the same thing. You don't have to know uh, exactly what the artist is doing um, to be able to appreciate the work. So I think the way that I'd like to structure uh, this talk is if I talk about some of the prize winners, um, maybe not all of them, because there's nine of them, but if I go some way down the track, and then uh, maybe you would like to ask me some questions along the way. I'm quite open to you asking some things and you can provoke me if you want, I don't mind, with questions. And you can ask me things about another painting. If there's something here anywhere in any of the spaces, I guess, um, that you would like to have a little talk about and open it up, then just let me know which work that is because there are 69 of them and I'm not going to talk about all of them. So the first thing is that there were, as you know, possibly, 225 entries. So when I arrived on Monday, there was a sea of work to look at, and it was a little bit overwhelming, actually, at first. I thought, I really am not sure how to do this, so I'm going to do it by instinct. And I'm going to split this up into a little sticker system. So I went round quite quickly, and I put some little red, red stickers on some work, uh, that I thought was a yes, and then I put some yellow stickers on some maybes, and I put green stickers on no's, and I didn't do anything else that first day, and the greens were taken out, and the next day I came in, and we had 90, around 90 paintings remaining. 
so there had been a lot removed. And out of those 90 paintings, which was too many for these spaces, these three rooms, we had to get get the numbers down. So another another 15 or so came out. We ended up with about 78 yeses. In doing that, I went into the green room and I brought some of the green stickers back. I brought four or five back again. And I took some of the yellows and the reds and I took those out to the green. So there was a little bit of toing and froing. And what I was doing was really trying to look at the collective whole of the exhibition and not just the individual work. There were some exceptional works that did not make it onto the wall. And that's the nature of a competition and you can't put everything up. And it makes it more special, of course, for the people who have got work on the wall as well if there's a, a tighter competition um, enabling uh, their work to, to achieve a, a greater sense of success, I suppose. So we ended up having to whittle it down a little bit more and we got down to 69. And then from that point, um, we arranged them all a little bit around the room and moved things around. There were a fantastic group of people here helping. This is not me on my own at this point. Um, and um, we tried to get a kind of a flow and a, a sensitive cohesion between works. And I wanted it to be, very much wanted it to be that as you toured the exhibition, you managed to somehow transcend the moment and get lost in each individual painting. From one painting to the next painting to the next one, it was an adventure. I hope you're, you're getting that as you move around. Every painting is different from the next. I don't think there are any paintings that are um, overlaps particularly. And that's an incredible thing. It's, it make, makes you realize how rich and varied the art world is at the moment. It's not like, you know, art movements of the past where painters painted in one particular way. I mean, years ago they used to have <coughs> a big uh, landscape exhibition in Auckland. Uh, I forgot what it was called. It was a, a tobacco award. Some, some people might remember it. What was it? Rothman. The Rothmans. Quite possibly, yeah. But it, um, it, the work had to be a, a particular size and had to be a landscape. And consequently, the adventure wasn't there as you moved around and looked at the work. Um, and they did, a, they did a little exhibition of it at the Auckland Art Gallery, a sort of little, uh, this is what happened when they had the Rothmans, if it was called the Rothmans, I can't quite remember, but I'll, I'll believe you on that one. Um, and it wasn't an adventure in the same way. So this is a real adventure. And it's about the individual expression of the artist as well. So anyway, the first work I'd like to talk about, am I talking closely to this? Is that alright? Um, is this one here. We'll, talk, we'll start with the winner. And we'll work down and see um, how we go with it. And you, you, you know, far away if you want to ask me anything at all. So this uh, exceptionally fine work by Francis Hansen uh, from Auckland uh, was not. This is not a case of my walking in here and saying that's the winner. It, this took a bit of time. <coughs> Once I'd got down to those numbers, finding the prize winners was a little bit tricky. Sometimes it's the throw of a dice, to be honest. Uh, it could be, it might not be. But all points started to point that way. And uh, I picked this painting because I'm left with uh, lots of questions. I wasn't entirely sure of uh, the reasoning, the intent of the artist here, but I rather enjoyed the journey and the adventure that it presented to me. I like the fact that it feels like, uh, as in a lot of, for example, Picasso's painting, it feels like the phone went halfway through this painting and Frances got called away and she came back and went, oh, I've lost the thread now. I have to go to something else. So it has this sort of sense of openness, of resolve, but being accessible and very open to interpretation. So uh, there's lots of the panel showing, the wooden panel that she's used. And the language is very varied. It's like a um, text or 
poetry when you when you uh, read it. It's the syntax, it's the rhythm, uh, it's the sentencing, the pace, the change, all the way through it. So you have these very broad sweeps of the dark underneath and the light, which are uh, these sort of amorphous areas that sort of hold these disparate little pockets together as you move around from these areas that are quite detailed and lovingly painted through here, through this area here. There's, I think, a, a little bit of, it feels a little bit of collage through here. Uh, there's some tape up through here, some, some brown packing tape. All sorts of things. She's used what she thought was necessary to get across something of a search, a kind of unearthing of something visual that will somehow liaise with uh, a particular vision that she has in mind. It's called A Pinch of Salt. And I went through look, the whole thing looking at that and wondering about the title. And, and at the end of it all, I, I realized that actually what I was left with was A Pinch of Salt. Uh, it's, she's not giving much away with this. There are some quite kind of um, odd little things. We've got this uh, little deer in the center here has this almost little stencil, curious little uh, figurative form here, the patterning holding <coughs> areas together. I think it's a real uh, mastery of a painter to be able to take these areas that are so incredibly diverse in language and to hold the whole thing together as a complete painting. I know a lot of you will be looking and, and disagreeing with me in your mind and not liking certain things. I think part of uh, painting is to be able to look at it and say, actually, you know, I don't really like that painting, but it's incredibly good. And to separate what you like and what you don't like from what you think is good painting and what you think is not very good painting. And for me, this is a, a, an exceptionally good painting, and I did like it. Um, I like the fact that she's used some opposites in terms of her palette. She's got the orange against the blue, which are two colors that are opposite on the color wheel. You possibly know all of that sort of thing. Uh, and they complement each other, and there's the sort of sense of them uh, down-mixing to the uh, achromatic or the less... Uh, chromatically intense areas through here where you've got this sort of cloudy, slightly moody, amorphous, floating aspect going on. So everything sort of floats in this space spatially and we're led around by these kind of uh, chains all the way through. Uh, what do they say? That a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. There's all sorts of interesting things going on in this painting that refer to uh, the smaller parts um, coming together into the whole, giving us a real experience of the painting. And I think when you look at this painting, if you didn't really warm to it, or you're puzzled by it, you should give it a bit of time, and you should look through it, because it's extremely consummate painting, in my view. I think it's uh, a painting that is unlike anything else that's here, uh, and it has a, a wonderful sense of colour, balance in the classical sense and order. Uh, you know, if some of you might know about things like the divine proportion or the golden section, which is basically one third to two thirds. So what that says is, you know, sometimes in a classical painting, an area of focus will be two thirds up and a third the way along, for example. So through here we have an area at the top coming down to this bar which points across to this area through here and this area through here is a divine proportion area this proportion of one third to two thirds is pretty much exact uh, divisional uh, divine proportional golden section and she does that here and then she does it over on this side as well through here and she brings in this focal area at this point here so we have these this real sense of classical uh, building going on in this work. And all these things come together in, in, a, in a way that makes the painting very strong, harmonic, uh, vibrant, an adventure, an uplifting painting, I think. And something that you should, sometimes you can look at paintings and say, I don't know what it is, but boy, I'm enjoying this painting. You know, just let it, just like that music I mentioned earlier, just let it wash over you, let it just be absorbed and enjoy the experience. So um, 
Is there anything anyone wants to ask about this one at all? Are there any questions that you would like me to answer that I'm not covering? Or are you all feeling all kind of semi-satisfied with that? <laughs> yeah? Okay, shall we move on to another painting? Are you, is that enough for that one for you? Okay, let, let's, let's move on to a different one. I'll go on to a, another prize winner. We'll look at that uh, one down through. I won't go in any particular order at this point. We'll look at this big red drawing at the end here, this, uh, this painting here. Sorry if you can't see from down there. Uh, this big painting by Sam Dolimore uh, from Pororua. Um, this painting, or uh, it's a drawing actually, it's, you know, it's done with red ballpoint pen. Maybe not one red ballpoint pen, <laughs> maybe a few hundred. Uh, and it's, it's an in incredible technical feat to make a work from red ballpoint pens like that. But I didn't pick that work because it was a technically proficient painting, I picked it uh, or drawing, I picked it because of its ability to pull you into its space. It has this sort of strange bodily orifice feeling to it, which is at once kind of compelling and repelling. Um, but it occupies the space in a way that um, really feels as though it's within the space, not sitting on it. We're pulled in, we're pushed back, there's this uh, really exquisite sense of the work dissolving into the space around it as it becomes denser in the mark making towards the edges. We can feel this sort of sense of blood flow within it and of course the colour um, might bring to mind you know, the body even more in some way. So there was something kind of uh, slightly macabre and um, compelling about this painting and uh, this drawing and I just felt that um, within it meant that it just had to go onto the wall as a prize winner. Um, again so that you could, with, I think with a, with a drawing like this it's amazing to be able to read it from afar and get in really close and really look at those marks, that language of mark making as she weaves and knits the form together. It's, in, it's obsessive. I mean, there's hardly anybody here, I'm sure, who could even imagine doing that drawing and keeping going on it. Uh, you know, there's hours and hours and hours of love and devotion in a work like that. So that work really um, drew me because of that and because of the kind of space that it suggests. It doesn't have the same sort of um, logical ordering as Francis's work in, term, in terms of things like um, golden section and pockets of areas that, that you are transported through. It's about the complete wholeness. There isn't particularly, I suppose, one area of focus, although if there was, it would, I, I guess, be through that uh, orifice form through the centre there, almost cave-like form that takes you right back into its space. So, an amazing drawing. Any any questions about this one? It's a love-hate thing, do you think, with this one? You thought it was a colonoscopy? Yeah, well, yeah, it could be, couldn't it? Some of you might be feeling straight away quite uncomfortable with that, remembering some experience you've had, I don't know. Can I just ask a practical Yes. If you did buy something, how would you mount it yourself? With a work like that, you'd need to, it would need to be framed and floating. Floating within a frame, so uh, a heavy, much like the little work that's next to it on the wall here, the framed one, you'd put it into a frame like that. Because well, they need to be two unmounted. Yeah, they need to be framed, and uh, that is quite an expensive exercise. Mm. Yeah. Okay, shall we move on to, um, let's move on to, we're going we're gonna to get you all to turn around now. It's that work in the corner by Kathy Barber. You can come over. <laughs> you, kind of, you kind of blend in nicely. <laughs> 
Um, this work is called Inhale. Kathy Barber uh, is from Auckland. She comes from, I know of her work, um, from many years ago, and her work has become extremely consummate lately. Her technique is extraordinary. I, I would defy any of you to look at a painting like this up close and know exactly how she's done it. Um, she has a background in the graphic uh, advertising industry and she's drawn upon her experience with lettering to build this work. Um, but it's done in a way that's extremely fluid. Uh, it's not as though she's um, just dealing with lettering. Uh, the first thing I thought with this work, it stood out actually immediately on the first day as a quite extraordinary painting. Um, and I wrote the, the piece about it, it was my interpretation of it, and she's the person who came to me and said, gosh, I um, didn't think of that. Um, but it felt to me like a painting that was very much about, um, it's almost underwater, it's like we're submerged, it's like we really want to breathe and the fact that it's called inhale seems to make sense. But we're pulled down, we're dragged down by these tentacles, that uh, these almost serpent-like forms that seem to entrap us, to entwine us, to hold us, to prevent us from getting up to the light or up to the air above. And there's a very strong sense of a kind of separation between the body and the soul in this painting. These are my interpretations of it. And I'm kind of quite, sometimes I think people look at paintings and they can interpret them in, in their own way and then they go, oh, but I, that's just nonsense. I don't get, I, I don't really know. You should trust yourself to interpret what you think is going on. And so I guess I've learned to allow myself to indulge in that, to interpret it. But I think it's an extraordinary painting. It's transcendental. It makes me feel very much connected with a sense of the human spirit uh, and the moment of being alive. It's about, I suppose, the, the opposites of life, life and death. And I did find myself quite drawn to those kind of works, weirdly. Uh, I'll talk about that again further on, the duality between life and death which is inherent in a work like this. Uh, but I think if a work can pull you from far off, far off, like this work can, and it can draw you to it, and as you get close to it, you realize there's so much going on, uh, and it's incredible in its um, deafness in the way that it's painted, then that's a, a really remarkable painting. Uh, so, this painting was uh, obviously uh, a prize winner. There are lots of depth too in the way that I'm talking about the near and far this way. We have lots of shadow forms that seem to float into the distance through this kind of slightly murky, watery, ephemeral space. And um, then we have this sort of sense of wanting to gasp as we get towards the top of the work. Salvation lies up here. Uh, this is kind of scary down in this area here. We want to get out of it, but it's not looking hopeful. We kind of drag down. So that, that's the sort of interpretation I got from that, that work. I think if a work can be a, um, a successful mix of technique and artist's intent, even though, as she said to me, oh, I didn't, I hadn't thought about it in that way. Um, there is nonetheless an intent that's there and it's that what that I was looking for this sort of feeling that the work is a carrier for something that's much bigger than itself as we see it that makes for a very special experience where you can return to a work again and again and you keep getting pulled back by it and are compelled by it um, extraordinary experience but any any questions on that one yeah, what does the artist herself think about, you know? The artist herself, uh, she is quite interested in things to do with the spirit and the human condition. I think when an artist titles the work Inhale, I think it's a kind of suggestion that that might be the case, that there's something to do with um, 
a living, breathing body, uh, or the condition of a living, breathing body. Um, so I don't think I was necessarily miles off the mark. I just think that the way that I had described it wasn't a way that she would have thought of. Which is maybe, really, you know, it's possibly where she was um, surprised. I, I'm guessing, though. But you'd have to have her here talking about it directly. But I think I'm, what I'm suggesting in it is, I don't think it's, I don't think it's as though she read this and said, well, that's just completely opposite to what I've been doing. I think it connects, but I've kind of extrapolated on it a bit, built on it a little bit more, interpreted it a bit more. Uh, yeah. Yes. I'm just wondering um, why people call the, their paintings the things they do. On this yes. one, it's really, I can see the link really clearly, but sometimes the titles are really puzzling. Sometimes, or they, yeah. Putting from yeah. Their own like, like pinch of salt. Pinch of salt. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes the title is it says what the work is about. I think if the title is a little puzzle. Um, sometimes it's because the work is a little puzzle. And it's not necessarily that you want that to be made clear. It was Francis Bacon, the British painter, who said, the artist's job is to deepen the mystery, not to clarify it. You don't want it, it's not a McDonald's advert. <laughs> you know, so I think that sometimes an artist will put something together in some way, feel something, and then feel that they don't want to divulge the whole thing. They don't want it to be like, look at the title, ah, of course. Yeah. Um, so I think it's connected with that. But it's, it's frustrating too, isn't it? Sometimes. Well, sometimes they seem to be claiming too much. Because, claiming too much. Yeah, it's a big title, and then it's really hard to see it in the Yeah, well, they might be thinking more grandly about it than we realise. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I, I think some, you've got to name things sometimes. Sometimes an artist will put untitled. <laughs> Uh, and let you just wander. Yeah. And that doesn't mean it's about nothing, it just means that they want you to interpret entirely. I think sometimes artists want to take ownership a little bit <coughs> over what there might be there, but they don't want to tell you either too much about it. So uh, it leaves it quite open. I think like Francis's work, as a painting is quite open to interpretation, the title suggests that it's still open to interpretation as well. So she's not putting the title for you to go there and go, ah, of course, that's what it is. Um, so I think it's connected with that. I think, you know, um, a lot of music is the same thing. A lot of music has titling, and we're like, well, what's, what's that got to do with the music? Um, I mean, Beethoven's pastoral sym symphony is, I suppose, is quite pastoral in terms of it. It's about, you know, the impending storm. You know that music? That nice free flow. You know, it's that whole thing. He's like, I'm just going to take you through to a storm. There's going to be a rising crescendo. Boom, with the cymbals. Okay, but actually it's called the Pastoral Symphony. I didn't even think about it as being uh, about exactly what it was. But when I read about it, it sort of spoilt it a bit. <laughs> I didn't want to know too much. So in some, sometimes artists say too much in their work, or musicians as well, in the titling. Sometimes they just say the right amount to leave us wanting more. You know, if you look at a work and you look at the title and it doesn't tell you enough, you've got to search the artist out. Haven't you? Go and find them. Francis is here somewhere. You can go and find her. Don't let, keep quiet, Francis. <laughs> Don't tell anyone where you are. But, yes. We were talking last night about the movement and the rhythm uh, in that work. Yes. And how yeah. that is. It movement involves... and rhythm, that's a very musical thing. You know, I mentioned that last night the shared language of the mu music and the visual arts of tone, colour, rhythm, harmony, composition. Uh, all those kind of things come together in this work. So, yes, this. An incredible rhythm from the uh, compressed density in this area to the openness through here. It becomes enthralling in a work in the same way that music doesn't want to be on one level, or poetry as one sentence is the same as the next one. You've got to vary things short sentences, long sentences, 
uh, crescendos, falls, you know, quiet, fallow areas, and so on. And I, uh, this work has all of those things within it. So it makes it quite engaging, I think. Um, well, well, while I'm here, I will just talk about this little work here next to it, which I think has been quite a popular painting for everybody. And I think one of the reasons it's so popular, this one by uh, Watin Akuhata. Um, I just thought this was like immediately a powerful work. Actually, as I'm talking about it, it's making my hair on my neck rise a bit. It's that kind of painting. It's um, very, very beautifully painted. It's quite immediate. It's not. It's not fussed around with. Some of these touches through here of these uh, fence poles are just one stroke, boom, and they kind of float a little bit too. Uh, this, uh, the technique, first of all, and the relationship of that technique to an intent uh, seem to be really beautifully entwined. So this is called ethnic fence. And it immediately, you know, I wasn't brought up in New Zealand, and I, uh, you know, I know there are lots of issues around reclaiming of Maori land and all sorts of things. Ethnic fence, it felt, it felt quite divisional. Um, maybe to do with tribes or colonies, um, and, but it didn't feel threatening. It felt to me as though he was creating a, almost an altar. Uh, the way that these have been structured so that there is a kind of a sense of a rise up and then a fall. Feeling as though it's at the end of the day, which is always the poignant points of each day, the beginnings and the endings. Um, made me feel that it was actually a wonderful painting and something that made me, I wanted to walk into it and walk up to these uh, fence poles as though they were an altar and pay homage to them and not feel that they were separating me from uh, another area but to feel as though they were actually almost welcoming me into God's land, you know, this kind of sense within it. So I think although it, if he were here, uh, he might say, again, I, yes and no. Uh, they're the kind of feelings I got from it. So nonetheless, there is a sense that this work is a huge, huge carrier for an intent that is over and above the immediate sense of what you see with the uh, slightly confrontational fence posts and the land that's opposite and the area in front. Somebody told me it's quite swampy around there. I don't really know where this where it is. It's uh, Pukino, Pukino, I think. Is it Pukino? No. No, it's not. Ka Ka Kaiowa. 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 It's quite swampy. I don't know. He's just talking over these. Oh, okay. Right. Anyway, I think it's a really extraordinary painting. I, I, I saw a lot of people looking at this painting yesterday last night and being quite entranced by it and uh, I think it's uh, you know it's got everything coming together it's beautifully consummately painted it feels like he's put his heart and soul into this he's got something to say yeah. and he's going to say it and but but it's not so confrontational that you feel uh, that you are not included in it it feels to me a, an extremely warm and welcoming painting. So, a remarkable piece, I think. Any questions on this one? No? All right. Shall we move to, um, uh, where should we move to? Let's, we move along the wall here. Um, this is a, a painting that took my eye very quickly. Uh, it's a work on paper. Um, maybe some ink with some body colour, some white paint to block things out. It's rather a disturbing form in a way. It's a bit like a scaffold. What I have read it as a scaffold with something hanging from it. Um, it's called Swan Song. So immediately talking about titling, as somebody asked earlier, it, the Swan Song really suggests what it might be about. It's, it's, it's the last act, almost. It feels theatrical. The uh, areas of black around the edge feel like 
a curtain almost coming down. Um, the, the scaffold, as I say, feels like a finality. There's something a little bit macabre about it. The form hanging from the scaffold feels like a body, but it also feels like a chrysalis. And the chrysalis feels like it's kind of starting to hatch. And there's life going to come out of that again. So it's not a, it's not a totally negative painting about death, it's about life as well. It's about rebirth. Uh, there's lots of shifting things going on as well underneath. Um, forms that she's had there that she's blocked out with the white. So there's been lots of interesting redressing of things. That so this is sitting here, but I don't like it now, I'm going to block it out. And what we're left with is this very fresh application of paint, this quite fluid application through here, of this weighty kind of pendulous kind of form, and it seems to be to, to be a carrier for uh, a metaphor for life, really, this painting, in, in its brevity, it feels right. I think a lot of people will, again, have looked at it and not necessarily be, in, you won't necessarily be enjoying the painting uh, as a lovely painting, because it's not necessarily a lovely painting, but it's certainly the painting that you've noticed, and if you allow it to, it might make you feel something else, like I'm talking about, the kind of things I'm talking about, that where a good painting can be a carrier for so many things. Uh, so um, I gave this painting uh, the award from the school that I've um, opened in Auckland. I felt that I wanted to give something back to uh, society, to the art society at large. So. Uh, I was really thrilled to be able to do that, give, give that away, and uh, she wasn't here last night, so I haven't met her, so I haven't even had, been able to talk to her about it, and uh, whether what I'm saying is a complete lot of rubbish or not, or whether she'll be saying, yeah, God, yeah, that's good, I, I, I don't know, but I'm passing on my thoughts about it. Um, Francis will probably relay some of that to Emma, and then she can tell me. <laughs> but uh, yes, so uh, not a painting that you wouldn't necessarily look at and go, wow, that's really beautiful, but I think it's poignant. It's a poignant painting, and, that, and I think at its best, painting can do that. It makes you feel something, uh, like I mentioned earlier with the painting, making the hair on my neck stand up. It's that kind of feeling, which music can do quite often, can't it? Uh, but painting can do it as well. Uh, somebody said, to me once, painting can't make you cry like music can. And I said, do you want a bet? It can make you cry, all right. Um, and, you know, there are classical painters, uh, modernist painters like Mark Rothko. If you ever go to London or to uh, Houston, Texas, and you go and see Mark Rothko's paintings, you realize the power of paintings to be able to instill a, a kind of um, feeling of melancholy, uh, sense of inward reflection. Uh, Francis Bacon, who I mentioned earlier, said, "If you want to be, if you want to feel seriously depressed, go into the Rothko room." <laughs> but um, but I don't think it's like that. I think it's an uplifting experience, and I think that's the thing: is to try and embrace painting in all its different genres and allow those feelings that you get from all the works here to. Allow, allow yourself to look at the work and get past the, like I said earlier, the I like it, I don't like it. Allow yourself to say, actually, I really don't like that painting. I certainly wouldn't want that painting, but oh, it makes me feel uh, super duper or it makes me feel depressed or whatever it is that you feel. Just allow those feelings to happen and see them as something that's relevant and, and um, those things add weight to the painting and the experience of it. Um, we'll move along, seeing as we're over here, we'll move along to this little painting here by Simone Goldsmith from Takatane, who's a young painter. And um, interestingly, uh, she was one of the packers and the unpackers. And I talked to her, I didn't know she entered. I didn't know that that was by her. But when we did the local award and the works were laid out, um, it seemed to be the standout one. It's a small painting, but it's quite got quite a big presence, really, in terms of its 
ability to pull you into its space. She needs to use perspective to its maximum effect. You know, through here she's got some sort of, uh, I'm not sure what, exactly what she's used for this, to be honest with you. It says mixed media, but there's some sort of fiber or thread through here uh, that is dragging us through this furrowed land, almost in a, a kind of intensity of a Van Gogh painting or a Van Gogh drawing, the way that it's pulling us into its space. But it also reminded me a bit of the German painter uh, Anselm Kiefer, who's made enormous huge paintings, they're not that size, but it has that sort of intensity and I think it's a masterful little painting in the way that it takes you back, but then you get to this wall through here and the wall is um, suddenly impenetrable. It makes you feel, it makes me think of uh, war a bit and the trenches and it makes me think of uh, also a kind of easier time where life seemed less complicated, a sort of sense of this ploughed land um, and this very simple landscape in the background, but beautifully uh, worked uh, and an immediate um, painting to um, reflect on, I think, and it drew me into it straight away. So um, I was thrilled to to be able to encourage her as well, because I I have heard since that she was, you know, not sure about painting and being going to art school and not going to art school, and I hope it's encouraged her. Everyone needs a bit of encouragement occasionally to be able to step to the next point. Any any questions? Just far away, any time if you want to. Um, shall we? Um, Gosh, there's so many of you asking you all to move. Seems like quite a tall order, doesn't it? Um, shall we? Let's have a look. Let's have a look at a work that's not a prize winner for a minute. And I'm going to just look down at that big drawing on the end wall here with um, pen and ink um, on paper uh, by Leslie Falls from Hastings. Um, and this drawing. Incredible, really. It's uh, sort of like a like a sequence of scanning points. The way that the human eye moves, you know, as you look around you at the world or talking to people, there's only an area the size of your thumbnail at any one time that's in focus. And what the eye does is it moves from point to point very quickly in a scanning sequence, and it pieces everything together to feel as the whole, as the complete unit. And we feel that we're seeing something entirely in focus, but actually we're not. As I look around at all of you, I'm seeing you all in focus, but not really. There's tiny areas that I'm seeing in focus, and then immediately everything becomes, around that becomes blurred. So this drawing, to me, is a sort of constellation of scanning points that come together to give us two quite big forms. It's um, called Mitre Tree. Uh, talking about titling, I, I don't know, that, does, that tells me nothing, Mitre Tree. Uh, but the work is a puzzle in itself as you look through it. The scanning points take us through the experience of um, her hand from point to point, but they come together in, some, in a very definite way, in the way that she's clustered areas through here into this definite sort of shape. Uh, and then it opens up. And there are points where you've got these little floating forms through here, which are really like here, there's just a little dot, a little circle. She's done these tiny little circles and a little line and another circle and a little line, piecing it together as a very, very delicate uh, adaptation of what it might be like to follow somebody's eye as they scan something. But we don't know what that something is. And that's what it feels like. That's the interpretation I got from this. Um, and it's the sort of work that you can look at and you can kind of lose yourself in it. It's like it's a bit mesmerizing when you look closely at some of the things going on in it. Uh, the intensity of it, a bit like uh, Sam's, Sam Donnemore's big red drawing, that obsessiveness. So lots of the best paintings have a sense that the artist is really, truly quite obsessed. Uh, and you, if you're a painter, sometimes you need to look at that kind of obsession and take on board some of it as well. 
you've got to kind of keep pushing with it. And artists often do things and achieve things that other people don't achieve because of that obsessiveness, because they can't give up, because they won't stop. I guess it's like that with lots of things, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah, an amazing drawing. Um, where else should we go? Is there a painting somewhere in here that somebody wants to meet to talk about? Are people happy to relocate into the other gallery? Do you want to go into the other room? Just before you go in there, the one that's third from the wall, yes. the diamond one, yes. is that painted or printed? Yeah, I don't know. I know that this is the painting, uh, painting and drawing board. I didn't really look at the um, the criteria particularly for this. I think it's we can get into little issues here, can't we, with uh, materiality? Extremely overlapping these days. And who says that painting has to be with paint? Who says that drawing? I'll take you through the other room in a while because there is an award in there by somebody who's done a drawing. As I said, but it's a drawing in space. But I think this is a uh, it's a digital print. Uh, whether he's done other things too, because it basically is described as ink on board drawn from video stills. That's a very very open interpretation of what he's done. Drawn from video stills. Does that mean drawn, or does that mean taken? So, I don't know, it's not my, um, my um, role to accept or um, reject works on that, on that basis, because evidently all the artists who enter have to sign a disclaimer of some sort about that, about the media that is used. And, and they have to see it as being, yes, this is the, the terminology has become more and more open these days about what that could be. So whether it's a print that could be, you know, you could say it could be, you could sell it and then it could be reprinted again, I, I don't know. Um, and that, it's a whole contentious area, I think. But you would be quite okay to feel a little bit kind of annoyed about that, I think if you wanted to, but you also <laughs> could say, you also could say, well, yeah, you know, drawing, painting, come media, overlapping, that's okay too, and allow that to, to happen. Uh, but, you know, this work is, um, obviously it sits quite flatly on the surface, uh, because of its patterning. Uh, it has a little bit of space for sort of almost Venetian-like blind that goes on in the background. And it's a repetitive pattern, it's the obsession of, of repeating. Um, and the works are on four panels and they just butt together to give us this complete uh, unit. Um, what does he call it? He calls it Up and Down Stairmaster. You know, there might be some video game or something I don't know about that it comes from. I don't know. But um, I guess it's, not, it's quite hard to talk about a work like this. I don't know a lot about it. Uh, but I put it in because it's completely different than anything else. It's one of the few of this uh, sort of genre of painting, and I'll call it painting, that um, I felt could be included just to stretch the variation of work that was on, on the walls. Yes? Just a little bit about what the, the Sorry. Uh, yeah. what the technique that's been used here. Technique in the corner one. Yes, in the corner, the corner one over here. This one is by Megan Collier and it's called And Whistling in Silver Light. It's acrylic oil resin on board. So uh, there's quite a uh, popular development in painting at the moment to put some very shiny resin on top of paintings. Personally, I'm not a massive fan of it as a technique, but it works in this particular painting because it holds the painting together. The classical way of painting was always that uh, paintings were done in glazes, and I'm talking prior to Impressionism. The classical approach was that paintings were built up in thin layers, and each layer was transparent, and it built up depth. 
and it actually meant that the painting would hold together. At the end, there would be a layer of quite yellow varnish, like a mastic varnish or a Damar varnish, and that would hold everything together like a net over the whole thing. So what she's done with this painting, which is very beautifully painted as well, uh, is to use oil and acrylic painting, and earlier, of course, it wouldn't have been shiny. She would have just worked on it in a very traditional sense, putting oil paint over acrylic. You can't put acrylic over oil, so she would have built it up from that position. Um, and then she will have said, okay, now I'm going to put the resin on. And the resin is going to be a way of combining and holding the whole thing together, but also acting as a kind of um, deflector in some way from the surface of the work. So it pulls you uh, back from the work, increases the depth, almost like looking through glass as you look through. And it makes the work less accessible, it removes it from us a little bit. Uh, and of course, you know, the other thing is that um, human beings love shiny. Shiny, we're like magpies. I like that. Oh, it's all glossy and shiny. That's nice. So there's a little bit of that going on. That's what always kind of makes me a bit suspicious about too much of that. There were quite a lot of paintings that were all shiny, had some resin on them, and this was by far the, the best one, I thought, and that's why it's included. But I think it's not to take away anything from her, from it. I think uh, that putting the resin onto it works beautifully. It almost turns it into a, a kind of tile of some sort that pushes it away from us. So yeah, I think that's a, a beautiful painting. Um, we could, seeing as I'm here, and there's a painting next to it, I could just say something about this one. It's not a prize winner either, um, this one, by, um, Kirsten Ferguson, she's from Dunedin. And uh, interestingly, a lot of the painting from Dunedin, um, a bit like the music, has a sort of grunginess to it. Uh, it's uh, very painterly, it's expressive, uh, the paint's quite thick, there's a real celebration and joy in the materials that she's used with this. Uh, and there's also this sense of uh, some, in this land, it's just called landscape, this sense that the land is bubbling, it's like a, 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 a torrent of energy at the bottom through here. And what it's doing is it's just pushing up occasionally with these little bubbles, almost like a mud pool. It's, and as it pushes up, whoop, like that, a little cloud floats up. A little cloud floats away from there. So you have this area of compression through here with this very painterly expressive approach and then it releases through here. She's gone back into here, opening areas up, leaving these kind of bubbles almost, these pushing uh, points upwards and releasing a cloud into the sky. So it's got quite a nice sense of the land and the sky being connected through it. Uh, and I think that that's really a, a quite remarkable little painting too, actually piece. Uh, when it came in we had discussions about was it a drawing, was it a painting, what is it? Um, this work is by Sarah Brock, it's called Automatic Drawing. So just as an idea, Automatic Drawing uh, was something that was developed uh, around about 1920s more or less and it's basically to do with the release of conscious thought. So automatic drawing is where you might take a pencil or your brush onto paper and you work by trying to work very rapidly um, without analyzing, without thinking. It's responsive, it's immediate. Hans Hartung is a pioneer of that, uh, the Swiss painter. Um, and so this work um, I put in because, and I know it's not um, contained within itself as you might imagine a drawing or a painting to normally be. It's spilling out. What she's done is she's used um, fishing line to give a sense that the drawing, which is very automatic, is actually escaping out of the work itself. It's dropping away like a waterfall as it falls. And as it falls into real space, which is the gallery space here, it casts some shadows onto the wall. So it goes from 
three dimensions and real space and then it throws back onto the wall its own drawing another automatic drawing and that drawing itself goes back into two dimensions on a flat surface she can't always control that of course <clears throat> and in here the lighting is perfect for it uh, but I, th I think it's quite playful but it's beautifully made as well it's beautifully rendered it's obviously got lots of thought behind it she's immediately um, telling me that she's knowledgeable about the history of drawing and painting by calling it automatic drawing if we're talking about titling the fact that it's called that tells me that and um, I think with a work like this you again you can have a little little fight with yourself if you want about is it drawing I don't think it's drawing is it painting but for me it's definitely drawing but she's partially drawing in air uh, and that makes it very relevant and it's really lovely to see a work that's like this so delicately rendered and actually if you look at the containment of the work at the top <clears throat> and how it spills out into space it's beautifully beautifully made with its kind of silk across the top it's made from silk graphite and fishing line I'm not sure where the graphite is exactly but anyway oh, it's drawn partially onto the surface of the silk so a beautiful piece very delicate and, and rather exquisite yeah beautiful um, how are we getting on? Are you all, all right? Yeah. Would you like me to move to something else in here? Shall we move to that portrait? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Do you need the white pattern? This is the last one? Okay. This is a portrait by Vicky Garden from Auckland. Um, Vicky Garden um, is somebody I've seen a few years ago. I saw some of her work. She's quite obsessed with her own face. She paints her face a lot, and that in the history of painting, painters have done that. Um, failing to get a model, what do you do? You look at yourself in the mirror. And she has quite exquisitely rendered herself in this space, looking somewhat kind of bored with herself. She looks like she's like, I'm not you again. Uh, uh, and there's this sort of sense of melancholy coming through with the piece. So what transcends with this work is not just that it's a beautiful drawing, it's almost drawn with the paint actually, it's quite thin, um, but there is a sense within it of an, emotion, an emotional energy, an emotive sense within the work that's over and above the fact that, as we can see, it's a very well-drawn painted head, slightly to one side, cropped at the top, the head here, some very nice kind of scratching through the paint as we try and uh, feel the hair and other elements as well. And there's a little bit of a sense in the work of the complementary opposites I mentioned earlier with Francis's work, the red-green uh, mix running through with the patterning in the background here with this uh, earthy red and this earthy green coming together to give us these quite beautiful half tones, these skin tones, sometimes peppered with sort of warmth around the eyes and around the cheek here and back into the lips. And this lovely reflective quality on the underside of the nose. It's just worth spending a bit of time with this painting, really looking at it and reveling in the kind of experience that she has had of looking at heads and looking at herself. Uh, and how, look at how amazing it is to be able to do a head like that and transport you and hold you with it and hold you longer. I think if a painting can hold you longer than the thing itself, if it's a representational painting, then that's pretty good. That's pretty amazing. If somebody, <clears throat> like in the other room, I haven't talked about it, but there is a drawing by Martin Ball up on the wall of some paper, the three pieces of paper done with pencil. You wouldn't look at three pieces of paper for very long, but you could stare at that for a long time because it's so incredibly uh, skillful in its rendering as well. So this is a bit like that. I think it's got a lovely position to it. If ever you're doing, if you're someone who likes doing heads, look for the animation in the head. You don't always want the head to be straight. Sometimes a little tilt, that sort of 
that little tilt of resignation uh, is a really great thing. And she's got that beautifully rendered in it, that sort of sense that she's walking past the mirror and she's glanced and thought, oh, <laughs> no, not again. I'm going to have to do you again. So, yeah, so uh, really um, fantastic little painting. I could go on talking about lots of these paintings. Yeah, I'm not sure about the timing and how we're doing, but um, maybe is, is there anything anyone, is there another work that somebody would like me to talk about? And is there uh, anyone who wants to ask any questions at all? Why are you feeling like you want lunch? <laughs>